Really glad you're here. Uh, if you got your Bibles, I'd love for you to flip open to uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, it's uh, the fourth Gospel account, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, it's totally cool. We actually have um, some Bibles in the back at our Next Steps table, um, and those are free. So those are our gift to you. Um, if you uh, never come back here, uh, that's totally cool, but our prayer is that you would have a Bible. Um, and so whether you come to High Point or you come to this ministry, uh, we want you to have the Word of God. So that's our gift to you. Welcome to go get one of those uh, either now or after, uh, up to you. Um, but we're going to be, like I said, in John. So just a little context of, uh, like I said, it's the fourth gospel written. Um, and a little bit of a context of what a gospel account is. Um, it's an eyewitness account. Okay, and so Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John are recordings of Jesus' life and ministry and his death and his resurrection. And so uh, if you're new to the Bible, John is an apostle, and an apostle means that he was a witness of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Okay, so there are no living apostles today, despite what you might see on social media sometimes. Um, but there are no living apostles um, in terms of witnesses of Christ, okay? So physical witnesses of Christ. Um, and then, right off the bat, I want to read this uh, passage from the end of John. So hate to go all the way to the end, but he actually gives the purpose of this book, why he wrote it, okay? Why he wrote it for the world. So he says it in John chapter 20. He says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So Jesus did many other signs that are not given in this book, but these, the ones he's written and given to us, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why he wrote this book. It's so that you would believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, not just the Messiah, but the Son of God, and that you uh, would have life in his name. So John makes a very simple yet miraculous claim about this book, right? In one sense, I would argue that we're actually answering two of the biggest questions um, that you really could ask yourself here tonight through this book. Number one is who is Jesus Christ? Um, even if you're not a believer, that has been a question for the world for the last 2,000 years. Whether you think um, Jesus was who he said he was or not, uh, many people study Jesus' life, and um, you would get laughed out of any institution that's a serious institution if you said Jesus didn't live, because um, he was a real person. And so the question is, is he who he claimed to be? And then the second question is, which more of you may have asked yourself, maybe you've never asked who Jesus was, the second question is, what is the meaning of life? We've all asked that question, I hope. Why are you here? Why are we here? How did we get here? What's the purpose of this life? And you're thinking, wait, John answers these questions in this text? Yeah, he actually does. So if you ask the world who Jesus is, some might say he's a Jewish rabbi, some might say he's uh, this cool, hippie, guru, philosopher, but he loved and you know, served his neighbors, served the poor. Um, he's a good teacher. Maybe he, was, he had some wisdom, right? That's kind of what the world would say. But they don't want to think of Jesus any other way. That's where they stop. Because if you ask the average person, hey, what does it mean to be a good person? Who would disagree in this postmodern culture that we live in, in our culture, who would disagree with what I just said? That it's good to love your neighbor, it's good to be kind, it's good to serve people less fortunate than you. Who would disagree with that? Not many, right? So that's what they label Jesus as, that he is this teacher who, like other philosophers, had good ideas, kind of like Socrates, but cooler, um, wore flip-flops, you know, walked around, you see pictures of Jesus all the time. So, maybe you're here tonight, and you're like, I wonder 
what Christianity is about. Maybe you're just curious. Um, maybe you're here tonight and you're trying to figure out what you believe about the world, which I hope that you have asked those questions because we all make moral truth claims. What do I mean by that? Meaning, we all make claims about how you should live, right? If you believe that we should live for justice for all, social justice, we should care for the poor, those are moral claims. Those are claims about life, about how you can be a good person. So whether you're religious or secular or you're a Christian, we all make moral claims about life. So I hope you would, have, you would want a justification for why you believe that. I hope you've asked those questions before. So tonight, John is about to give us the reason for why everything exists and why you and I were created. And I'm not exaggerating. So don't take my word for it. I want to see who John, a witness of Jesus, said he was. Right? Like, I don't want to know what some religious quote, religious scholar today who studies the life of Jesus says he is. I don't care about that, to be honest. I don't care about who Jesus is in my imagination. I want to know who is Jesus Christ. And the only way I can do that is look at his life. Look at what he did. Look at what he said. Look at what he claimed to be, right? I can't, I can't call the color blue red. It's not red. So you can't put something on Jesus that he never claimed to be. So this is the way the, the actual recordings of a witness of Jesus, John later on in the book says he laid his shoulder on Jesus. He was that close to him. Now that might sound kind of weird to us, but it was different culture. Um, but anyway, he's a close follower of Jesus for years. I want to know who he says he is. I want to know what Jesus said about himself. That's how you know who Jesus is. So let's read the text. So John chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Stunning. So, I got five observations about the text right off the bat, okay? So we're not going to break this down in headings like I normally do. Um, I got five observations about what John is saying through these eight verses, and then we're going to walk through them. This is what John's saying. Number one, the word had no beginning. Number two, the word was with God and was God in the beginning. Three, the word is the source of all life. Number four, the word is the source of all truth. Number five, this book is about witnesses of the word. That's what John's saying. So, John describes right off the bat, he was a follower of Jesus for three years. He wrote this about 90 AD, so he was the longest living apostle. He was the last apostle to die. So he had a lot of time to think about this. He had a lot of time to think about, how am I going to start this book? Right? And this is how he starts. In the beginning was the Word. He goes back to the beginning. Not when Jesus was born, right? He goes back to the beginning of time. Before there even was time. In eternity. Everything had a beginning. You and I had a beginning. The world had a beginning. The universe had a beginning. Galaxies had a beginning. Matter had a beginning. The Word didn't have a beginning. Before anything was created, before there was any sort of material or energy in the universe, there was the Word. 
That should stun us. That should jar us of what he's claiming. So I want to figure out who, who is this word? What is this word? What is he talking about? Now, in order to truly understand what he's saying, we need to have some context about the word that he's using, okay? So the word, literally the word in Greek for the word is logos or logos, if you've heard that word before. You can hear the word logic in there, logos. That's where we get the word logic from. And that word, the logos, had a ton of cultural significance to who John was writing to. So there's the Greek audience, because John wrote this in Greek. Greek was the, the dominating culture at the time when he wrote it. And then there's the Jewish audience. So he wrote it to both Jews and Greeks, or Gentiles. Now, the Stoics, so there's a group of philosophers, of, of Greek philosophers called the Stoics. There's a bunch of different groups. The Stoics believed that the Logos was the rational principle by, by which everything exists. Okay? And what I mean by that is, they looked at the world, they looked at creation, and they were like, huh, it sure is pretty balanced. It sure is pretty in order, right? There seems to be this order in the universe. Like everything has a look to it, everything has a reason. It seems like there's a balance to the universe. They called this the logos, okay? And it was just a principle. It wasn't personal. It wasn't a personal God. It was just, there has to, we had to have come from something, so there must have been this energy that began everything. That's what they believed, okay? So, to be honest, it's really not that different than what a skeptic would say today, right? There, you got, I mean, you got to believe we came from something, so at some point, this energy started, and everything came into existence, right? It's not personal, it's not a god, it's just a thing, it's just an energy. It's a cosmic energy or principle. That's what you kind of have to say today. So, there was a lot of debate among the philosophers, what is the logos? What is the reason for life? Why are we here? What's the purpose? Okay? The one group, the Stoics, they thought life was about self-control. They thought the logos was, oh, you got to suppress your emotions because emotions aren't going to last in the afterlife. You got you to gotta just get through things. You got to suffer and you just got to take it. That's how you get to know this logos. That's how you align yourself with ultimate reality. Then the other group, the Epicureans, thought, no, 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 life is about figuring out how to be happy. Okay, so it was suppress your emotions or you got to be happy. Figure out what makes you happy, that's the logos. Okay, so those are the competing things at the time. But in general, Greek philosophers thought there's a logos, it's not personal, it's just a cosmic principle. And all of us need to figure that out and align ourselves, and that's how we get aligned with ultimate reality. Okay? So that's the logos in the Greek context. In the Jewish context, you should know, Genesis 1.1, the very first verse in the Hebrew Bible says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? So, and then verse 3 says, God said, let there be light. So God created things by his word. When he speaks, life gets created. So John knows this. So he thinks about this. He says, okay, in the Old Testament, God's word is how he spoke everything into existence. And then the Greek context, the logos, the word, that's what he uses. And he says, there is a logos, but it's not a cosmic principle. He's a divine person. That's what he said the Logos is. In the beginning was the Word. He was in the beginning with God. He puts a personal pronoun to it. He says it is personal. The Logos is personal, and it's a he. It's he's a divine person. That's stunning, and that's huge, and that should stun us what he's claiming. Verses, the rest of verse 1 and 2. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. So a lot of people uh, who, um, I guess, critique the Bible, uh, critique what Christians say or believe, they will say, well, you know the word Trinity is not in the Bible, right? As if, like, we didn't know that. Um, and we're like, yeah, no, you're right. 
Trin- the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Let's just make that clear. I've looked. It's not in there, okay? The problem is there's verses like this that say the word was with God, the word was God. Okay, those aren't the same thing. Can we agree on that? That's not the same thing. You can't be God and also be with God and not be multiple persons, right? So that's where verses like these, Christians go, oh, it seems like God has revealed himself as one God. He is one God, but he has three persons to him. He has three distinct persons. The word was with God. The word was God. It sounds like two distinct persons, okay? Not two distinct gods. One God, distinct persons. But more on that later on, okay? Because he doesn't reveal the third person of the Trinity here. So he will later on in his gospel. So we'll cover that more. But the creator of everything, we know from all of Scripture, is tri-personal. He's one God, three distinct persons within himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? Now, all other philosophies and beliefs up to that point said that the universe was about, like I said, finding a set of principles to align yourself with so you can be aligned with ultimate reality. Because don't you want to figure out why we're here? Don't you want to have a purpose for your life? Don't you want to have an ultimate reality for your life? Yeah, People have been saying that for thousands of years. And so the Greeks thought, it's a set of principles. You gotta figure out what to do. What do we do, right? So that's what they thought. Verse three. It's almost like John's saying, (laughs) verse two, like, hey, just in case you were confused about verse two, because you're kind of like, okay, he's the word, so he's with God, he was God. Are you sure you're saying he's God? Well, let's look at verse three. In case you're confused, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Just in case you were confused whether the word is God, nothing, look around, nothing was made without him. That's pretty clear, I think, I hope, right? All things were made through him, without him was not anything made that was made. The eternal son is the creator. Now, where do I get son? You're like, I don't see son in there. Well, I have to cheat a little bit and go to verse 14, which we'll cover next week. But in verse 14, he says, the word became, the same word that he says in verse, verses one through three, that word became flesh, put on flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son, so he replaces word with son, the only son from the father, Okay? So that son was in the beginning with God, was God, created all things. The eternal son of God is the creator. So, pretty stunning, right? He's claiming that Jesus Christ didn't have a beginning. That he created all things. Now, we need to pause and recognize John was Jewish, (laughs) okay? John was Jewish, and so if what he's saying is not true, that's blasphemous. He believed that Yahweh in the Old Testament had revealed himself as one God, and there is no other God, and he was the uncreated creator. And that he thought, you could, as God had revealed himself at that time, you couldn't actually see God, right? You couldn't physically see him, and you wouldn't see him until heaven. That was his worldview, as God had revealed himself through the Old Testament scriptures. And now he's saying, Jesus Christ, somebody who had human flesh, is the creator. So if that's not true, that's blasphemous, right? That, you can't just go past that. That's a blasphemous claim if it's not true. If Jesus isn't God, John, I mean, in the Old Testament, he would have gotten killed for being a false prophet. 
So John has this view from the Old Testament that Yahweh is high above us, uncreated creator. You can't see him. He's calling Jesus Christ. That's God. That's meant to stun us. He took years trying to figure out who Jesus is. And this is how he begins his book. He went all the way back to the beginning. He said, that's God. So, this same creator who revealed himself to Israel as Yahweh, John's claiming he put on human flesh, which is a miracle. It's called the incarnation. You didn't think you were getting a Christmas message tonight, did you? That's what Christmas is about. Christmas is not about what the culture thinks it is. Christmas isn't even about what Christians make it about sometimes. Christmas is about God putting on human flesh. Christmas is about the miracle of the incarnation. If you don't believe me, this is 700 years before Jesus was born. This is Isaiah chapter 9. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Oh, there's that word. A son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's 700 years before Jesus is born. Prophesying the Incarnation. Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In him was life. Think about that. The word is life. Before anything was, there was life, and it was him. The word is the source of all life. So he said so far, if you're keeping track, the word had no beginning, He was God and was with God in the beginning, and now he says, in him was life, which means life had no beginning. There has always been life, the triune God having perfect love within himself forever. Before anything was created, there was life. Now, if you're an atheist, you have to say the opposite. You have to say that life came after matter. Right? You have to say the opposite. Because we came from somewhere, right? And if matter was the beginning, if there, it, there was this random energy that just popped out of nowhere, that was before life. So that's what you have to believe as a secular person, that life came after energy. That's not what Christians believe. Life has always existed, which means love has always existed. The three persons of the Trinity having perfect love towards each other. Then came everything else. Guys, that really matters. That life doesn't have a beginning. Verse 5 is um, an absolute masterpiece, if you want my opinion. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word for overcome there, um, you might see in some translations, it says comprehended it. So the light has not comprehended the darkness. This one says overcome. Now, you might be like, well, wait, those aren't the same things. Well, we have English words like this. So if I say the word grasp, okay, I could grasp this water bottle, Or I could grasp a concept, right? Those are two different things, same word. So John uses a word that can either be translated, overcome, or comprehended. Now, what I think is so interesting is um, you can, so uh, Dr. Tim Keller says, the way that you can reject Jesus is one of two ways, if you look at this verse. Number one you can reject Jesus because you are opposed, completely opposed to the idea of your need of a savior. You can just oppose him, right? And that's the overcome. That's the light has not overcome the darkness, which means the darkness is in direct opposition to the light. If the darkness is trying to to overcome the light and he says the light has not overcome it, that means it's in direct opposition of it. 
right? So that's one way to reject Jesus is to say, I don't need a savior. I can be good on my own, right? That's one way. And that's today's secular culture. If you're a relativist, meaning truth is not objective, truth is subjective, truth is what I make it to be, that's relativism. That's, you can't tell me what the truth is. What I believe is what I believe, and that's true. You can't tell me what's true for my life. That's, you're a relativist, okay? So that's rejecting the truth. That's saying, I don't need it. That's one way. The second way to reject him is to not comprehend him. This is the moralist or the religious way. This is the Pharisees. You know how the Pharisees rejected him? They didn't get him. They didn't understand him. They're like, wait, <laughs> you claim to be the son of God. You claim to be, have existed before Abraham was, thousands of years before. You, you have this claim, and you, you claim to be the Messiah, but you dine with prostitutes and tax collectors? What do you, that doesn't make sense. They're not good people. Right? So they don't comprehend him. They didn't get him. They didn't see who he was. They didn't understand him. And Jesus' response to his dining with tax collectors and uh, uh, prostitutes is, I didn't come to call the righteous, but call, to call sinners. They didn't understand him. They didn't comprehend him. They didn't get him. And they would look at that, and you're saying, so you say, you're saying you don't have to be a good person? Why are you dining with these Sinners. That's the other way to reject him. Is to think you're doing the right things, to think you're following God. There are people in churches all over the place who think they are following Jesus and they're not. Because they don't comprehend him. They don't get him. They don't see what he is and who he is. So those are the two ways. You can reject him outright or you can not get him. Now, Let's stop for a second, because I can feel the modern Western brains in here, and I'm American too, I'm not making fun of you, I'm American. I can feel the glares, I can feel it, and you're saying, Ryan, you realize that you've just said Jesus Christ is the creator of all things, he's the source of all life, he's the source of all truth, you can't do that. What about all the other religions? You can't just claim that your way is true and everyone else's isn't? That's not right. That's one of the big arguments against Christianity. It's too exclusive. You can't just claim all the truth. Well, there's a common illustration that a lot of secular people have tried to use about religion and truth, and it goes like this. There are three blind men and an elephant, okay? Each blind man grabs a part of the elephant and they describe what they feel, right? So one grabs the leg, describes it, one grabs, grabs the trunk, one grabs the tail, they all describe it, and it all sounds different, right? And the secularist person says, that's how religions are. Everybody's got a piece of the truth, but nobody's got the whole truth. You can't claim that, right? So a missionary named Leslie Newbegin, who heard this all the time, finally heard it one last time, and he said, wait a minute. To claim that all religions are equally valid and all religions have a piece of the truth, but nobody's got the whole truth, the only way you could know that is if you knew the whole truth. You see that? You're saying nobody's got the truth, everybody's just got a piece of the truth. How can you know that unless you see the whole elephant? Right? So what's his point? His point is, even secular people make truth claims. When you say, I believe in justice, I believe in caring for others, I believe in caring for people less fortunate than me, that's a truth claim. What do you got to back that up? Why should I do that? So, here's the point. Whether you're religious or not, you make truth claims. Any truth claim can be exclusive. It depends on what the truth is. I would argue Christianity is exclusive in the same way that it would be exclusive if a doctor was given a cure to an illness that everybody died from. 
Would you, if you were that doctor, would you just keep it to yourself and say, ah, nice, something for me and my family to enjoy and nobody else? Would you do that? Or would you get on the TV stations and the radio stations and go to everybody and say, I have the cure? Is that narrow-minded? Is it narrow-minded to say, I've been given the cure to your disease? Or is it just what you would do? (laughs) So, Jesus Christ claims to be the logos, the logos, the reason why you and I exist, the purpose and reason for existence, and he claims to be the only way to salvation. He said he came to solve the problem that separates us from ultimate reality. That's his claim. Why, if I believe that, would I not plead with you to consider who he is? If that's what I believe, if I believe that Jesus Christ is the reason for existence, to know him, to love him, to enjoy him, if that's what I believe, why would I not plead with you to consider who he is? That would be so selfish of me. And that's exactly what anybody would do if they thought, I got the cure to every disease. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to my Father except through me. I'm the Logos. I'm the reason for life. I'm the reason why you're here, is to know me. I'm the ultimate reality. So, you can't just take his claims and brush them off as he's a good teacher. He doesn't claim that. So we've seen the word had no beginning. The word was God and was with God in the beginning. The word is the source of all life. The word is the source of all truth. And finally, we see in these eight verses, this book is about witnesses of the word. He concludes by saying, verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, this is not John the Apostle. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about John the Baptist, another John, which we'll talk more about that soon uh, because he has a whole, pretty much a whole section in the next chapter, or the end of this chapter about him. So we'll talk more about him soon. But um, I want you to see this about John, of what he's saying here. John the Baptist, who he's claiming, or who he's writing about, embodies what what being a Christian is. He doesn't identify himself as the light or even a mini light, right? John doesn't say, look at me, I'm kind of like him or I'm a mini light, I'm trying to be like him. No, that's not what he says. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion or set of beliefs in the world. If Jesus was just a religious founder like others, He would have came and said, here are the set of principles and rules that life is about, and if you do all these things enough, you'll reach the true reality. Right? That's what he would have said. That's what other religions say. This is what life's about. These are the things you have to do to align with ultimate reality. Go do them, and do them as well as you can. That's what religion's about. That's also uh, what secularism is about because, again, who would disagree that you should be a good person, right? So you make all these claims. You say, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to be a good person. So religion, secularism, it's here's the way to live a good life and be a good person. But here's the problem if that's your way of life. Whether you're a relativist, like I said earlier, subjective truth, I make my own rules, or you're a moralist, a religious religious person, a Pharisee, who says, I follow the rules, whether you're either of those, you at some point will oppress people. And here's what I mean. If I keep the standard, if I follow my subjective truth, I do the right things, guess what? If other people aren't, what's wrong with you? Shape up. I can be a good person. Why can't you? 
you look down on people. And if you're a religious person, we know religious people look down on people, right? The Pharisees were all about looking down on people. Why can't you keep the rules? Why can't you do better? Why are you getting in trouble all the time? Why can't you earn God's favor? So whatever your solution is, if it's relativism or religion, you're eventually going to look down on people. Because at some point, you're either thinking you're keeping the standard, or you can't, and you hate yourself. So at some point, you're going to be an oppressor. Maybe you're not immediately, but at some point, you will. If you're keeping the standard, you will look down on other people. But that's not what John says. He says, I'm not the light. Don't look at me. I'm just here to point you to the true light. That's what he says. He says, I'm a witness. Christianity is loving the true light. It's treasuring the true light. It's pointing people to the true light, not to me. Don't follow me. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Only look at me if I'm following Christ perfectly, which I don't. This book is about witnesses of the true light. That's what Christianity is about, is if you're a disciple of Jesus, you point people to the true light. So if religion is your answer, or, rel- uh, or relativism is uh, your answer, you might be thinking, well, wait, if, you're, if, G- if you claim Jesus is God and you think you have this truth, why wouldn't you oppress people? Right? If you think you got the truth and you think Jesus is God, aren't you going to look down on others? No, or I would argue, if, if you truly see Jesus for who he is, no, and here's why. Philippians 2. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped or exploited, but he emptied himself, or he made himself nothing by taking the form of a servant. How did he make himself nothing? By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He put on human flesh. God himself put on human flesh. In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. If this is at the center of your life, how do you oppress anybody? Paul's whole point in that chapter is, hey, be humble. He didn't have to say that. But his motivation for being humble is, look at your God. He humbled himself to the point of death. If that's your God, how do you oppress anybody? You're saved not by being a good person, but receiving a person. In Christianity, our God died for his enemies, which is us. We're rebels to God in our sin. He died for us. So if that's our God, how do you go around looking down on people? That's what he did for me? This is the logos. This is the moral claim of uh, Christianity, that Jesus Christ, being God, did not count his equality with God as something to exploit people with, but he served people. He gave up everything. He lost everything on the cross. If you receive this Jesus by grace, man. So this is the gospel. I'm going to cheat ahead and look at a few verses later. We'll see these next week. This is the gospel. I'm, I don't think you could put it any better than this. But to all who did receive him, who received him, not earned their way up to him, received him, who believed in his name, he gave, it's a gift, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, not your earning, but of God. You receive a person in Christianity. You receive grace And as we close tonight, if you've never been told about this Jesus, Jesus who had no beginning, Jesus who created all things, I just want to read some statements from Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1, 
For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's Jesus Christ. It's not the Jesus of your imagination. It's not the Jesus that the media says he is. He's not just a good teacher. He is the creator of all things. He had no beginning. And you might be tempted to say, how can a man claim that kind of authority? How is he not an egomaniac? Who claims to be God? My answer is, look at his life. Look at how he constantly loved people and served people and showed compassion for people, sitting not with kings or rulers, but with prostitutes. He dined with the most marginalized, the most impoverished, the most outcast people, calling out religious leaders who loved money and power. He had no money, no place to sleep, no house, no political power. You know what he's most known for? Dying on a cross. That's his character. So put his claims and his character together. They make no sense. Who claims to be God and yet constantly serve people? And he's most known for dying on a cross. This man is either the greatest liar in history, which doesn't align with his character, he showed, or he's crazy, which doesn't align with the truth that he speaks, or he's the Lord. That's it. Those are the only options. You either have to say he's a liar, he's crazy, or he is who he said he is. And if he is, if he is the Lord, then you should bow down and worship him. So, as we close, in light of who this eyewitness claims that Jesus is, Here are the three questions every single person in this room, including me, has to ask ourselves. Number one, do you believe in this Jesus? The divine word, the creator of all things. Is this Jesus who you believe in and follow? God who put on human flesh. Number two, is this Jesus the treasure of your life? Because you know what's scary? Even the devil knows Jesus is God. The demons shudder at his name. So what's the difference? They have an intellectual knowledge of, yeah, he's God. I can't do anything about it. So what's the difference? They don't know him. They don't see him for who he is. They don't treasure him. They don't enjoy him. They don't delight in him. They don't know him. They know him. They don't know him. Number three, are you willing to surrender everything to this Jesus? Because if this is your Jesus, the eternal son of God by which everything was made, he created all things. In the beginning, him and his father always existed, father, son, and spirit. If you repent and trust in this Jesus, This Jesus will cause you to fall to your face in worship. And he will cause you to give your life to him. Everything, not a piece of it, all of it. This Jesus, the creator of all things, who when a storm happens could say stop if he wanted to. The winds and the waves obey him. This Jesus is the creator of everything, who humbled himself, was born into poverty, lived a perfect life, suffered an agonizing death on the cross, and then he rose. Because death cannot hold him. Death cannot defeat him. He's the creator. He speaks life into existence. He rose three days later, and now he's back at the right hand of the Father on his throne, if you believe and trust in this Jesus, this Jesus who commands the galaxies by the word of his power, this Jesus who commands the waves and the winds, 
this Jesus, the giver and taker of life, nothing happens outside of the counsel of his will. The devil has to get permission to do something from him. This Jesus who looked at the tomb of Lazarus and said, come out. When he speaks, life happens. And he obeyed. This Jesus had compassion for his friends. This Jesus saw people like sheep without a shepherd and he cared for them. This Jesus saw a woman in shame in John 4 and revealed himself as the Messiah to her. He lifted her up and gave her honor. This Jesus cried out to his father in the garden, sweating great drops of blood because of the agony before going to the cross. This Jesus is perfect grace and truth. There is nobody like him. Behold this Jesus. Give your heart to this Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are who you are and not who I say you are or not who I think you are. You are who you are. You are ultimate reality. And God, you came to this world to reveal what real life is, what ultimate reality is. And it's to know a person. It's to know the God of the universe. This is what we were made for. It's to know you and enjoy you and follow you in joyful obedience. So Father, I don't know what people have thought Jesus is coming in here tonight. But Lord Jesus, I pray that you would call your sheep by name, that they would see you for who you are, that they would see you, Jesus, as the glory of God. Father, I, uh, like Kyle said earlier, if you're looking for an example as somebody who doesn't sin, then don't look at me. I'm a sinner in desperate need of your grace. So, Father, I pray that if there is anybody in here who does not know you, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. God, we love you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.